So yeah, um, pretty much, I think the worst slot a speaker can get is right before lunch. So hopefully this will make up a little for you. Um, I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so it'll make up a little. And I know a lot of you are probably thinking yet another Gen AI topic, right? So how many of you are completely and utterly bored by uh, listening to Gyan on Gen AI? Please be frank. Show of hands would be very, very useful. I can flip and change my topic at the last moment if required. <laughs> How many are bored by listening to this? I don't know if it's just my Twitter and LinkedIn feed, but every second topic seems to be a generative AI uh, post, right? So I'm going to try to make it a little bit different. This is not going to be a lot about technology and all of that. I'm pretty sure given this is a tech conference and given this topic, everybody's already on top of what technology is needed, who are the vendors and so on and so forth. There are a couple of slides over there, but uh, mostly this is about our perspective about, you know, how this thing is going to evolve, you know? And um, as you all know, it all kind of exploded into public consciousness somewhere around November of 22 when uh, ChatGPT released for the first time. And frankly, when it comes to me, I was an initial skeptic, right? So um, every two or three years, a trend comes, blockchain comes, then Web3 comes, and they essentially end up being a hammer that looks for a nail. My first impression of generative AI was the same, that, you know, this is overhyped technology with not a lot of uh, end user use case. I have become a complete convert, by the way, at least on the end user usefulness part. And the reason for that, one of them is what's showing up on this slide, right? That the technology itself actually works. And it works for very meaningful things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, which we would ideally like not to do. Summarizing a, one, a very large PDF into a one, uh, one page summary for our manager, right? That is something that this can help with. So what happened with the technology very recently is that a variety of tasks, the machines got as good as humans because of this technology and hence the end user usability bumped up to a level where, uh, you know, people were accepting of this technology that they were not of, let's say, um, some of the others. The second thing that happened, which is the ease of use, right? There is a very famous quote by Andrej Karpathy, which says that uh, English is the new programming language. So what does this mean? Unlike, let's say, a large data lake, if you are an end business user, you do not need to know Python or SQL or R or any programming language for that matter to actually get benefits out of this tech. You can get benefit out of this tech simply by typing in a query in uh, English language, right? And I have seen the excitement even in CXOs, C not just the CTOs, but the CFOs, CEOs, CMOs, when we've done workshops with them and showed them hands-on using a bunch of uh, chat GPT prompts to generate images on a Dolly or Mid Journey, and then use Synthesia to kind of create a video within 15 minutes. And they have seen that it's so easy to do that they really do not even need an EA or a CEO's office or a CXO's office to do this. That clicks the benefit into place that there is an end user benefit. But, and there is a but, because of that end user benefit, you see a huge amount of VC dollars flowing in, in spite of the funding winter, right? So all of you who are running startups, I'm sure, are facing a fairly large amount of resistance to new funding, except for people who are pitching a Gen AI uh, project, right? And as you can see, there's almost $8 billion of VC funding in there. I say eight and not 24, because 16 of that 24 actually comes from the hyperscalers investing into um, Anthropic and uh, OpenAI. There's almost $8 billion, which is almost at levels, which is at the VC hype before uh, in the immediate pandemic research. Right? Having said that, so VCs are investing, but if you look at the second chart, companies are not putting investments in yet. Right? So that chart, just uh, for explanation's sake, is looking at year-over-year -year annualized increase of capital expenditure that firms across, um, uh, across the globe are making into IT and other uh, capital expenditure assets. Right? You can break that down and you will see probably that banks and financial institutions are um, slightly higher, somebody else. But the point remains, industry has not jumped in with both feet universally investing into this technology yet. However, when you ask CXOs, which is what the third slide, say, third uh, chart says, all of them say that they want to invest, right? 
Now, one of my marketing professors said that if you do a survey and ask people how many of you brush twice a day, you'd get a 100% response. The toothpaste usage would tell you uh, are very different in the real story. So we'll see. At 2024 ends, when we look at this uh, chart again in 2025, hopefully this shows a little bit of an upward curve. Anecdotally, speaking not, as I said, with the CTO, but speaking with CFOs and CEOs across a range of industries, even industries like public sector banks, right? Public sector banks, they don't even, they're not even on the cloud. They are on-prem. They don't even have a proper data lake. There is a public sector bank headquartered here in Bangalore that has a 45-member data and analytics team that they've set up under a chief general manager, and they already have launched four generative AI-based uh, POCs, one of them in production, putting a auto-generated video bot for bank PO training. So what this bot does is it simulates a customer conversation, and after the training period, the uh, probationary officer is actually expected to interact with this avatar of the customer, resolve the issue, and get a score, and only when they get a score which is above the uh, passing criteria are they supposed to have. So the point being, a PSU bank, personally, for me, would have been the last place I would have thought would have adopted this. They are enthusiastic about adopting it, right? So anecdotally, we are seeing uh, adoption, most of it in POCs. A few people globally have uh, published case studies. A very famous one is Klarna, for example, who came out with a um, $40 million saving estimate about a couple of months back, saying that uh, their CX operations have improved to the extent that they've been able to you know, uh, improve productivity by 70% or something of that sort. But anecdotally, we are seeing a lot of interest. We have seen interest in companies as varied as logistics, which want auto RFP generators to be created using generative AI. Uh, we have seen interest in companies in manufacturing things like batteries, cement, etc., which have said that we have a lot of plant and machinery uh, manuals and incident reports which can help our new technicians service a faulty machine, which it is very difficult to train them using the physical material. Can we create an employee co-pilot, right? So the point being, there is a lot of interest. There is a lot of uh, valid interest. Hopefully, we'll actually see that translating into investment dollars uh, you know, uh, through this year. And what are those investment dollars going to flow in, right? And what are the trends that investment dollars are going to catch, number one? And number two, as providers, where are providers moving in? So there are four or five areas in which I think this uh, whole technology is going to evolve, and I'll uh, kind of touch on each of them. Before I do that, however, I just want to stop here. The slides are not so important as probably a few questions. If there are any questions on what I said over the last couple of slides, I'm happy to take them before I move on to uh, the next slide. I'm pretty sure you've had death by PowerPoint by now over the last three, four years. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> so one of the things that we are seeing happening is, right, um, a lot of the advances that will come in in the tools getting uh, implemented will be on the RAG side. So RAG is Retrieval Augmented Generation, which essentially is meant to stop the LLM from hallucinating, right? So what it essentially does is it says, give me your answers from a particular context which I will provide to you in terms of documents in a vector database. Do not go crawling outside of this to give me the answer. The structure of the answer, you can use your native understanding of the English or whatever language you're answering in to get back to it. So folks who are doing RAG, we were doing very simple, basic RAG, but we are going to get into much more complicated, advanced RAG. And a couple of examples here. Uh, all of this will be done to optimize cost, right? The biggest cost in running a Gen AI solution today is, inf sorry, there's a question. Oh, oh sorry. The biggest cost is inferencing cost, right? And the way you can reduce inferencing cost is two ways. One is you mix LLMs. So the best LLM today on the OpenAI uh, stable is GPT-4, which is 10 times more expensive than 3.5. So if you can have 3.5 answer 95% of your questions and only have four answer 5% of your questions, your average cost gets to be much higher. But And that LLM mixing or routing of the query to 3.5 or 4 by determining which query is complicated and needs to go to 4, needs to go to 3.5, that is advanced RAG. Another way of reducing cost will be to store the responses that the LLM has given you in an on-prem on cache. By on-prem, I mean it could be cloud as well, on a cache, 
and before actually even sending the quest query to the LLM, sending it to the cache, serving it through the cache if possible, and saving all the inferencing cost from there, right? So that sort of advanced query routing, uh, query enhancements, et cetera, is where you will see a lot of investments coming in um, around the uh, you know, application development front. The second thing will be agents. So uh, LLMs are very good at doing autonomous tasks. So as an example, if I'm running an inventory uh, you know, replenishment model, that inventory replenishment model basically has several uh, you know, steps to it, right? The first step is determining what the demand forecast is, checking against stock, determining whether my uh, stock at an SKU level has hit safety uh, stock limits. If it has had hit safety stock limits, going to the uh, PO system, generating a purchase order, sending that purchase order to the uh, sending the purchase order to the vendor, informing the warehouse of the incoming uh, purchase so that they can you know keep volume secured for that. All of this today is probably either done manually or by a very basic RPA, which needs to be coded every time uh, you're changing the process slightly. And LLM can do this much more efficiently in terms of interpreting the prompts that you give it in context of even change circumstances, right? So you'll see a lot more of companies coming up with agent-driven architecture, which uses an LLM to actually automate entire workflows rather than just a query engine. Uh, the security part is, again, what we are seeing, uh, Anthropic has a very good paper on sleeper agents, uh, which says that one of the things that current security guidelines are not very good at handling is sleeper agents. So what sleeper agents mean is that LLMs and people who are developing LLMs are getting smarter. They understand what sort of security testing happens during uh, deployment, and they are actually, with prompt injection, able to get the model to behave such that it passes the security test, but once it is deployed, after activating a sleeper prompt, it can then become malicious uh, if a user so desires, right? So current security architectures will need to get upgraded to take care of uh, prompt injections of this type of sleep. We don't have that. So you will see a lot of firms coming up around the whole security and gov In fact, I met a gentleman here who was working on uh, governance and security, and I think this is one area you'll see a lot of uh, investments coming in. The third part will be model choice in terms of multimodality, unimodality, large models, small model, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, multimodality is obviously very useful because the same model can handle multiple mod mod uh, modes of uh, documents that you insert. It is obviously costlier as well. So you will see a lot of choice that the CIO's team, CTO's team, CDO's team are making as to where to use a large model, where to use a small model, a large model you need to use where you have a much more generic use case. You want the model to learn from non-domain specific uh, learnings as well. And the business benefit is such that you're okay to pay the higher cost and live with the higher latency. If your model requirements are such that you don't want to pay the higher cost, you're okay with it being unimodal. I'll give you an example. There was a software company uh, who creates data lakes and lake house uh, architectures, right? They published a paper which said that they trained a model, which was a very small model. It had in the hundreds of millions of parameters as compared to like 500 billion, which uh, GPT 3.5 claims. For one task and one task only, when they create a data lake, they upload the schema of the data lake into this model. The model creates a data catalog by itself, right? That's the only thing it can do. But because it does that very, very efficiently, a team of apparently three engineers in six weeks was able to build that using an open source uh, LLM. So you'll see a lot of that kind of uh, utilization happening as well, where people take a very considered call on which LLM to use, small, large, multimodal, unimodal. Obviously, I mean, the fact that securing the data is going to become important, it goes without saying, it is also going to come down to regulation, right? You saw the government of India trying to regulate uh, in a little bit of a ham-handed manner the uh, usage of AI models, and a lot of that regulation is to understand what data is given the result and why is it giving that result, right? So model explainability. So data provenance and explainability of results, you'll see a lot of companies, softwares, tools coming up, which try to answer that question so that specifically 
clients in uh, highly regulated industries like banking, insurance, telecom, etc., they are able to get their models passed through uh, the regulators. And at, at the end of the day, uh, so anybody here who's actually tried to buy a GPU-based machine will understand there's almost like a waiting period of six months. And um, a class divide is really coming up over here. The big hyperscalers are booking GPUs way in advance, and they will be the guys who will have really a, a short supply of uh, GPU machines, whereas some of the smaller players might struggle, right? Now, this will change if Intel and other chip makers are able to get chips in place which are cheaper than uh, NVIDIA chips and also then uh, break the supply scarcity. So this is dependent on the fact today that NVIDIA is almost owning the entire market and other chips are not uh, there at all. Right? So s some of the trends that we think are going to play out over the, so you know, it will be interesting next year to come and see how many of them actually play out and how many of them are completely wrong. So I mean, as you saw VC investment pours in and when VC investment pours in, what happens also is that the availability, um, you know, of availability of tools increases a lot. So our perspective over here is that all of you who are deciding on which tool set, which tech stack to go upon, there are two choices you have to make, right? So there's the choice you have to make on your infrastructure, where our opinion is that all the three hyperscalers will pretty much have common capabilities. So don't necessarily go into a multi-cloud environment just to take advantage of one cloud provider's uh, Gen AI capability today. Eventually, they will all converge. However, on the application front, remain fairly flexible. Uh, don't get locked into an application today because the industry obviously is evolving so fast that a application which is top of the line today may not be top of the line tomorrow, right? As an example, look at all these models. So anybody who's been um, following the Hugging Face model leaderboards will know that GPT-4 was a very clear leader amongst all models if we go you know, six months back. That gap is uh, closing. And that gap is actually not just closing by proprietary um, foundation models, it's also closing by people like Mistral and people like uh, Meta who are giving you open source models, right? So then you're inferencing, it's getting closed by folks with a higher degree of accuracy and a much lower variable cost uh, that you'll get to you know, deploy your models at. So uh, because this gap is going to close, we believe that you need not actually take a multi-cloud decision basis what their current LLM stack is and keep your options open on the application because if there is an application which is locked into one of these models, that might not be the best application necessarily six months down the line. Final uh, slide, which is that regulation is going to come down and it's going to come down hard, right? DPDP is in... Uh, in the works, it'll become reality very soon. There will be an AI and a Gen AI component added to it. There will be a lot of focus, as I said, on provenance of data. There'll be a lot of focus on uh, ensuring that you have explainability of why the uh, model is giving the output that you have. So when you're making choices about which model to use, et cetera, et cetera, how to set up the entire environment, it will be very, very prudent to establish that lineage, observability, provenance pipelines to begin with, rather than trying to tackle it post facto once the regulations uh, actually come in. So that's it. Uh, hopefully, some of these messages resonated and answered some of the questions you had. Now, I, I, I'm uh, done with the presentation as such, so glad to take a few questions if there are.